Hi, I'm Paris Francis and I'm Head of Customer Value at Walk and Work and we are partnering with the Black Cultural Archives um, to amplify the voices of black marketers throughout history um, and for the future. Um, and this has come about from months of, of trying to understand how we use our influence at Walk to influence the industry um, and understand where and why and the impact that black marketers have on brand activism, on diversity, on brand and advertising, everything in between. Um, and something that Walk are really committed to is making those changes in our industry um, and influencing from the inside and, and via our content. So that's something that I'm very passionate about and the brand are completely behind um, and hopefully it's something that we'll be able to carry on into the long, long future. Hi, so we're here today at the Black Cultural Archive looking at the history of black marketers um, and the future of black marketers too. And today we're joined with Kevin Morosky. Um, if you want to give a little introduction of who you are and what you do. Uh, yeah, my name is, um, as you just said, Kevin Morosky. Um, I'm a creative director currently at Havas. Um, and also the co-founder of POC, which is People of Culture Collective, which um, actively exists to improve the experience of black and brown and other ethnic minorities within creative industries, not just advertising, but across the board. Absolutely. I think that like, leads quite nicely onto my, onto my first question. Um, so thinking of like, the, the current state of diversity, like, equity and inclusion in a creative industry like advertising and marketing, how would you kind of describe the industry at the moment? Um, I think it's problematic. Uh, I think it's, um, I think it's problematic and I think it's performative and I think it's a lot of middle class um, white men and women that are like, oh great, this will look great on my CV and it's a bit of a tick box and it and they have no understanding of how important it is and how they're affecting lives and can save lives. Um, what a privilege it is to be in advertising and why it's important for advertising and creative spaces um, to be diverse, for real, for real, not just like, ah. Oh. <laughs> not just a tick box. Not just a tick box. Um, so yeah, um, I'm not impressed with it whatsoever. So what drew you to advertising and what made you stay? Ah, uh, yeah, closed doors. Um, closed doors and I've never believed in that saying, curiosity killed the cat. Mm -hmm. It's like, where's the door closed? Why is the door closed? <laughs> Why is it closed? Why are you lot going in but I'm not allowed? Why is the door closed? Um, so yeah, initially I started out as a photographer, didn't even know that black people could be photographers. It was from a space of just listening to Biggie Smalls and his music and his poetry and seeing those pictures. And I was like, oh, I want to create stuff like that, you know? So I just shot for the longest time. Someone got me Nan Golden's book, Devil's Playground, and saw her documentary style. I was like, oh, that, that's what I've been doing. That's the same thing. Um, Loki thought I was better than her as well, to be <laughs> honest. Uh, so then I got in photography that way, which then, um, and initially I was just all film, and then uh, digital came out and video was attached, and so bit by bit, and you're like, oh, actually, I like this, and taught myself how to edit. So for the longest time, I was doing a lot of um, fashion and editorial stuff in video and film, but realized I was like a token in the room. So I was like the kid you would grab to be like, look, we're diverse, we're doing it right. And I was like, mm, I'm not a puppet, what is this? And I was hitting these glass ceilings and what was really frustrating at that time was, I, don't, I didn't know what the glass ceilings were, I just knew that I was like, 
why can't I go any further? It was just, it didn't make sense. Um, and then I happened upon advertising or the idea of advertising and the idea of, well, if I understand the money that's involved, if I understand the business aspect, if I understand what all of these roles are and what everybody's doing and what account manager is and what's this, that, that, um, maybe I can change this. And I think initially it was um, for myself just because I was frustrated. And then when I got into the industry, I was like, oh, you lot are wild. Like, I'm going to stay here and disrupt this for as long as I can. Um, so yeah, so closed doors. I was like, just doors that would open for other people, but wouldn't open for me. And I, I just couldn't comprehend it. Absolutely. I think you kind of answered a bit of my next question. So obviously there's barriers in an industry like this, in most industries. What kinds of, do you have any almost like prevalent experiences of barriers that you've had to overcome? And how did you do that? Um, yeah, I think in terms of, so I, I don't have like um, a formal education in terms of like no A-levels or no degrees. I, try, I actually did try to go to university to do a degree. Uh, I went in with my portfolio, which at that point was self-taught, um, got accepted. They put me straight through to the second year because they were like, you'd be bored. <laughs> and then only lasted two or three months because um, my tutors were like, because at that point, all I was buying was dig, um, film cameras from Boots and they were two for ones. Mm -hmm. And my tutors were like, right, so you're gonna use like your, um, your loan to like buy such and such camera? And I was like, no, I paid my rent with it. What are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> like, also you just let me in and made me skip a whole year based on my portfolio that was shot on these little cameras from Boots. So I don't see what the problem is. And I use that example um, as my experience throughout the industry of the different ways that I've attacked ideas or, or projects mm -hmm. um, or client problems. Um, there's always been that, why are you doing it that way? I'm like, but why would you do it that way also? Like, my point of view is valid. I wouldn't have been hired in the first place. My experience and lived experience. Like we, we advertising is this space where the magic of um, imagination and creativity is meant to thrive. And we figure out wonderful ways to communicate with people and low key sell stuff to people, sell stuff that they don't need to people. But it is about communication and making people feel um, whole. Like, where else are you going to find talent that's made for that? Um, unless from a background where you didn't have that much and you have to make magic out of nothing. Mm. So um, the, bound, the boundaries are always just like, why are you doing it this way? This is the way to do it. This is the traditional way to execute this, this is how you do that and the other. And there were things that I had to learn on the fly in terms of acronyms and stuff like that. And like, you know, the language of it all. But for the most part, yeah, it was just, again, gatekeepers just being like, no, this is the way that we do it. We would never do that. And it's just like, nah, I'm gonna do it this way. I know, I know it's gonna work. And it worked. Yeah. Exactly. And thinking about, you, you mentioned briefly before um, working with clients and having to work through those conversations, which can obviously be quite quite difficult um, and quite precise, I'd mm -hmm. say. Um, how are you successful in kind of creating that space to say this is the right way to do this because my lived experience is my lived yeah. experience? I, um, I'm me from the get-go. If you're my client, listen, we're gonna to work together, it's gonna to be amazing, but please know if you are making crazy decisions, I'm gonna stop you and be like, this isn't gonna work. Mm -hmm. Like, my relationships with my clients are very honest. Um, I don't, I, I love the way that I talk because I sound like a South Londoner with elements of my grandmother in there. So it's a little bit of like Jamaican and like, I don't wanna say broken English because that, that's not the right term, but there's just bits and bobs of, all the rest of it, and I've, I've seen um, other black and brown colleagues be in a room and speak a completely different way, code switch, 
and then when we're on lunch, it's a completely different person I'm talking to, which is no tea, no shade. I think survive however you want to survive. Do you know what I mean? But for me, I realised from day dot that I'm just always going to have to be genuinely authentic in the room, and this is how I feel. Um, if you have to ask me to um, explain one of the words that I use, that's completely fine. It's a learning moment for you. It's not an embarrassing moment for me. So I'm going to invite you into my world. If we're talking about my culture, like, I'm a don when it comes to my culture. Like, I know it like the back of my hand, and you should just be listening. And then we can have a conversation about it and see where we get to. That's the exciting bit. Absolutely. I mean, I love what you said. Just, just uh, <laughs> um, Thinking of, like, brands and clients that you've worked with, or just looking at the, the industry as a whole, do you think that every brand, almost every company, needs to be an activist brand? Um... Yes, but also, I say yes, but I'll follow that up with saying, I just think it's common sense as well. Like, who doesn't want equality? Mm. Who doesn't want um, equal opportunities? Who doesn't want a fan base, a customer base, or working environment that is inclusive? Like, it's a no-brainer. So it's not that the fact that you even have to ask that question and some people will be like, oh, maybe we should, like, that's wild to me, but yeah, every, every, all of them should be. And it's a really simple thing as well. It can come from a space of just, there's this thing, right, in companies where they're like, oh, we're gonna get all these like young people in and train them up. That's banging, but also what about your senior spaces? Because you, lot, you man can't communicate with these youngers because you don't know what they're about. Mm -hmm. They're human at the end of the day, they have a different experience. So if there's nobody in your senior spaces that can communicate and make them feel welcome and like get the best out of them, you're not gonna, you're not gonna get anywhere. So yeah, every, every brand should be an activist fan brand because that, that's not, I don't know, it's not a, it, it's, it's a good thing. Like why wouldn't you wanna be a good thing? And there's different ways that you can do that. It doesn't have to be, you know, like, I'm not saying that H&M has to turn into a green piece. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But there's just different ways of doing that. It doesn't always have to be vocal or right out there. Um, it can be internal. There's little things that you can do as well, I think. I agree. Um, and then are there any, let, let's think about black brands. The so black owned brands are being spoken about more now than ever. Are there any brands that kind of come to mind when you think about actionable activist work, big or small? Um, yeah, I'm gonna, I think I'll talk about a smaller independent one, which is like, um, I have a friend, her name's Kalechi, and she runs um, Kalechi Studio, which is a dance studio. Um, what I love about that studio is how inclusive it is, um, how safe it is, um, and how it's managed with like a different level of professionalism and from the space of what professionalism means to black and brown women within this country, mm -hmm. uh, not the traditional, hate that word, uh, point of view of professionalism. So classes are on time and space and la 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 la, but it's all from a very, very black um, point of view. And I think, for me, that brand as a whole, especially where it came from, because initially, if no one knows Kalechi's story, she just wanted to like teach twerk. It was at the time that people were very confused and thought Miley Cyrus had invented this whole dance, poor things. And she just wanted to do, she just wanted to teach. Yeah. And she went to this particular um, studio that was teaching dance and had a twerk class. And um, they rejected them and was like, oh yeah, like your, your twerking's a bit basic, we teach la 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 la. She was like, bet, I'm gonna go and make my own space, which is why you, you kind of have, why, why she has her space now. And I think um, that space compared to the space that rejected her, 
they're miles apart from I even in the space of professionalism and the way that they deal with clients down to um, evolving the language even if you look at the social posts it's very inclusive inclusive sorry of like non-gender conforming people trans women trans men gay men la 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 and it just rolls off the tongue it's so simple and then you put that brand right next to other bigger brands and it's clunky and it seems it, it feels like you're watching a brand from the 1980s mm. it's 2020 yeah that actually leads nicely onto my next question of um, <laughs> like, are there any brands that are not getting it right that you kind of don't admire and what kind of advice would you give to them to be less clunky? There are, yeah, there are loads of brands, loads of brands um, that are not getting it right. Um, I won't name mm -hmm. and shame, not because I'm scared of the smoke, it's just I don't feel like they deserve the energy, but what I would say to them is the reason why you're not getting it right is because you're not listening to the target audience that you want to tap into. You're trying to tap into target, target audiences purely for um, monetary reasons and that's it. Oh, you know, it's Pride Month, let's throw all the money we can in this space. And, but the people that are doing the work are not on the LGBTQIA spectrum. Uh, they have no lived experience with him, what talking about, um, there's no intersectionality within your team. So you may have a gay guy on your team, that's great, but he's white and he's middle class. His experience doesn't mirror my experience just because I'm gay. So, yeah, I think there are loads of brands that are, are completely getting it wrong because really what they need to do is go start from scratch uproot everything and be like, right, there's a reason why when we talk about racism, we use the word systemic. Um, it's not a thing that it's just like, right, we've realized we've got racist, ra racist systemic problems, but we've hired this person. It's like, no, like we need to go back to your policy, like how you deal with black women's hair, how you deal with like safe spaces, like all of those things, dig up your roots and start again. Um, and I think that, that goes for most brands out today. The new brands that are like from Gen Z and like that it's in, you know, back to Kelechi, it's already in there. Mm. It's already in there, but you other guys, no, it's not it. So would you say those are the three kind of actionable things that you would recommend to a brand to do next? Yeah, I think authenticity, like look at like the stories that you're telling and look at um, the agencies that you're hiring to tell those stories. Are they on board as well? Are you holding them to account? So it's about authenticity. I think it's about looking at your system as a whole. Like, great, you were founded in such and such a year, and that's an accompli accomplishment. But where's the growth? Like, move it forward. R dig up all the things that are no longer serving you as a business. and. Uh, the world as a whole for everybody. Um, yeah, so authenticity, digging up your roots. Um, and I probably add in there just like getting it wrong. Like it's okay for you to get it wrong as long as you're open to being like, oh, okay, we got that wrong. Let's start again, apologize, keep it moving. Like no one, when you get it wrong, there's this thing of like, okay, what part of my body can I sacrifice? It's like, it's not that deep, like just apologize, bring the right people in to help you navigate it correctly, learn from it and keep it moving. It's really simple. I agree. Um, and then if we go back to kind of like to POC and the amazing work that you've done in, in founding, um, in co-founding uh, the company, um, how would you say like your networks have dealt with uh, the heightened conversations around Black Lives Matter? Um, diversity, equity and inclusion in advertising and the kind of increased focus on black people, black people to almost have the answer to some of those deep rooted systemic issues that you've mentioned before. So I think how POC initially started was uh, me and co-founder Nana Bempa, um, 
we literally were like, where are all the black people in advertising? Because whether we were in the same agency or separate agencies, it was just me and her in the room. And we'd be in the room and it was just us. And we were like, what is going on? And then Black Panther came out. And we were like, we should build Wakanda. Like, where is Wakanda? <laughs> literally, no word of a lie. And it started as a, a WhatsApp group. Because um, we just started adding people. And I added two people, Nana added two, they added more, they added more. And then I think within a week to two weeks, we were at almost at capacity. Who knew you could have a capacity on WhatsApp? It was capacity. Yeah, so we got to capacity and um, the, the original beauty of, um, and it still is the beauty of POC, is that there were people around you that allowed, that, 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 that confirmed that you were being gaslit. Mm. This happened at me to work, this happened at me, this happened to me at work today. That's not cool, this is what you can do, here's a resource here. Oh, that also happened to me and this is how I dealt with it. Because mm. you didn't have that before, you just, these things happen, you're like, oh, maybe I'm overreacting, maybe I'm not. And um, so yeah, so POC is initially just like a safe space and I think when, Black Lives Matter was trending for all of two weeks. Um, POC became even more of a safe space in terms of, there was a space to go to, to be like, is anyone else feeling overwhelmed? This has just been asked of me. Should I be charging this? Should I be that? We were already running and, and, and already like in, that, that was a natural thing for us to adapt to. I think also what was really interesting about POC was um, there are so many private members clubs that then had to like stop and were scrambling to become a community online and digital. And it was really interesting to just sit back and be like, rah, like we're fine, you know, we're just doing work and getting work out and collaborating and sharing experiences with each other mm -hmm. and Meanwhile, other like, yeah, private members clubs were just like, we're now online community, sign in and you can la la and you can chat here and you can do this and just scrambling, um, which I think was gratifying and interesting to us because initially when we started Park in the early days, uh, there are a lot of people that kind of like, when we were in rooms talking to people, they'd almost like chuckle at it a little bit, like, oh, it's just a WhatsApp group. Okay, but then cut to, as you're saying, just like the past kind of two, three weeks, mm -hmm. um, we were already in the space where we were just thriving and enjoying it and being able to say no and enjoying that kind of um, power, not from an egotistical point of view, just like feeling, I guess, redemption and just like, oh, like, cool. So you're gonna do that job? Are you gonna go and talk? Yeah, but I'm not sure how much it costs, but, well, so-and-so did a talk, so probably talk to her. Um, so I think we, we were fine. We, we had a great, we have a great support network. Mm. Um, and it thrived underneath that pressure. It was annoying because, as you said, the whole industry all of a sudden were looking for new black best friends or brown friends. Like, oh, do you want to come and do this and show we're not? And it's like, mm. But, um, yeah, we thrived. And we are thriving. We are thriving. And you mentioned, um, you touched on it a little bit earlier as well, in like creating sustained change within the industry it comes from not only just hiring young black and brown people with different lived experiences and have true intersectionality within that, but also looking at kind of senior leadership of companies, brands, agencies, whatever it might be. How, how are POC approaching that sustained growth in that area and looking to like nurture the next generation because I agree that is where the change comes from. So POC initially is um, this safe space, this network community, and that's always at the forefront of everything that we do. So any commercial work or clients we work with, all of that always goes back into the community, whether that's at our meetups, being able to pay for space for the meetups when we get back to physical meetups, whether it's, um, putting money into a pot to pay for someone's like course, education or whatever. It's all for the community. 
The two things that support the community or a couple of things that support the community is the production side, which is like pop productions. Um, we have a roster coming out quite soon of like directors. Um, and then on the other side, we have like pop um, studios, which is creative and strategic thinking, et cetera, et cetera. We also have um, recruitment and we have pop talks. In any one of those spaces, like we're always going back to the community and making sure that the varied levels um, are there. So it's like a junior paired up with the right senior person. So they're protecting each other, but then we're also there as a further backup, as a duty of care to be like, is everything okay? La la la. So yeah, we talk what we, we, we live what we talk, sorry. And we try to implement that in, in that way, making sure that junior people are going up. Within my personal work, even at Havas through to POC as well, it carries through in terms of if I've got to present, say to you as a client directors for a job, all you're gonna get is show reels, no names, no genders, no production houses attached. Your job is to look at the work and be like, which one moves you to most? Cool, we're gonna go with that. Yeah. It's not for you to be looking for double-barreled or there was some such or la 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 la. So they must be good because again, that's a form of nepotism and it doesn't allow us to open the doors for new uh, young talent or people who just haven't had that shot yet. And it's the same thing with POC. When we send over CVs or things like that, it's like it's very watered down in terms of the accomplishments and mm -hmm. what that person is about, and not necessarily where they've been before or this that or the other so yeah we try to lead by example and those are definitely things that the industry can take on board that's the myth that we need to break through this like ah, oh, it's brain surgery you've got to be careful no stop being problematic stop being sexist stop being racist stop being homophobic stop being transphobic all the phobias stop it not even phobias like like, you can be scared of spiders. Do you know what I mean? Like, it makes no sense. I even hate the way that we say those words. It makes absolutely no sense. It's not that difficult, okay? Like, we all understand how we came to be here on this little island uh, and around the world, colonization. And it's, in root it's, it's, it's rooted in everything that we do and the way that we communicate, okay? A lot of people, uh, not but a few weeks, months ago, had a realization that this is the truth. And a lot of black and brown people are like, oh wow, you caught up, great. We're all here now, but now it's time to do the work and be like, right, scrap everything, bring the right people in to make sure that there are different voices in the room, that the conversation is intersectional, diverse, representative and inclusive, all of those things. And then start from the, like, start from the ground up and you'll see how quickly your brand will fly. Like, I don't know any brand that has really failed because they were diverse. But I tell you what now, like your brands that aren't diverse, you think I go into any shops when like I'm outside the shop and the whole shop window is like white models. I'm just like, cool, that's, you don't sell stuff for me, not my coin. And then I look over and it's, it's inclusive. Oh, bet. Absolutely, you walk in. And then just to, just to end on, to like bring it back around kind of full circle. So we mentioned how important it is to, to educate like the, the younger generation. What kind of, if you were to give three, kind of a top three, um, top three pieces of advice to a teenager or to someone in university who is thinking about getting into advertising or marketing, who is black or brown, what, would, what advice would you give to them? Um, that the industry is sick so you will run into uh, what I like to call dinosaurs which are usually stale pale men who are just trying to hold on to their power um, and they will be scared of you because essentially you are the meteor that's going to kill them um, but you can't go into that space and when they're telling you those things about yourself or dismissing your ideas, don't take that home with you. They reject your idea, cool, put it in your back pocket 
um, I can't tell you, I'm quite renowned, me and my creative partner are renowned for like quick ideas and turnarounds and the truth of the matter is um, I'm going to lift up the, 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 the curtain is they're just ideas that got rejected by someone who couldn't see the worth. And then like a year later, someone says, la la la, and I'm like, ha ha. And they're like, this is great, how'd you do it so fast? I'm just dedicated. It's not that like, you're gonna get rejected. People aren't always gonna see your vision, but you can't take that home with you. That's got nothing to do with you. It is what it is. Um, second thing I would say, go and make your own, um, your own things. Don't let, don't pour all of your passion and your joy into this one space and this job. If, you, if that job is literally at the moment killing you, but it's paying your bills, cool. Let it do that. Let it do that and let it sit over there. Meanwhile, over here, bring all of your color and all of your things, start your own network, start your own pox, start, start your own things, find people that are like-minded like you and go and create because it's not about the likes and it's not about the views. Like, it should be about your intent and what you're trying to do for yourself primarily and your community and the people around you. Um, and the third one, um, have fun. It's not that deep. The, the real basis of like culture uh, and, and what's lit and what's not lit and all of those things literally come from black and brown and other ethnic minority people and people who are marginalized because they've been pushed into a corner with not but one or two things and they have to make magic out of it. Meanwhile, the people with the most stuff have absolutely no idea how to make this stuff. But they're always like, parent, what are they doing over there? Okay, cool. Let's commercialize it. Yeah. Everything that's like trending, cool or whatnot literally comes from a black and brown or ethnic minority space or marginalized space, an intersectional space, a space that didn't have that much but made something out of what they made. You lot are the source, you lot are the magic, and they're not going to tell you that you are, so you have to tell yourself that you are and find people who are gonna gas you um, the way that Donald Trump's hair glue gasses his wig. <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> thank you so much for your time. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,